unless meditation is understood and unless the reason for meditation in the infinite way is understood the rest of it doesn't add up the rest of the message doesn't come out even the reason is this in the years of my work in uh, seeking practicing and in some small measure demonstrating spiritual wisdom I learned that it is an impossibility for us to get anything to achieve anything or acquire anything and the reason is that we are already infinite to begin with and in the beginning we were heirs of God joint heirs to all of the heavenly riches from the very beginning the father said son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine but with the basis let us forget now your human experience it is because of your human experience and mine that we're here your human experience has been a very disappointing one there isn't anybody in this room whose human experience hasn't been disappointing or they wouldn't be here anyone who is completely satisfied with their lives is so satisfied that they're not seeking anything and so the moment we start seeking it is evidence that we haven't found that we haven't discovered that we haven't reached a point of satisfaction of completeness and so it is that we have found our human experience to be disappointing or less than satisfying less than complete less than the infinite way of course represents my individual experience and uh, therefore it makes no claim to being all the truth there is in the world it is the truth as it has been revealed in my individual experience and so I am not presuming point of and uh, like everyone else or at least like everyone else whom I've ever met on this search I wanted to find something somewhere somehow that would add to my completeness to my perfection something that would make me more whole and harmonious than I was at that moment and of course that led to a very long and a very roundabout search because ultimately I came to the place of, real, of realizing that the master knew exactly what he was teaching when he revealed that I am the son of God heir of God and if an heir joint heir with Christ to all of the heavenly riches I knew that scripture was correct when it said son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine I knew that from the spiritual standpoint eventually I saw that point that you cannot become the son of God because in the beginning before Abraham was you were already the child of God joint heir to all the heavenly riches but that this had to be realized it wasn't enough to affirm it it wasn't enough to declare it I saw people getting into more trouble than they were originally in by going around with affirmations like I am a child of God and I am spiritual and I am whole and I am perfect I knew and that it was the truth but that the very affirmations were preventing us from realizing it eventually the unfoldment came 
that everything that the Master, Christ Jesus, teaches about our relationship with God is true and was true from the beginning of time but that it becomes necessary for us to achieve the realization of that truth the realization of that relationship now then the question comes how do we come into the realization of that which we already are and of course you can see that the clarifying point was right there that since we already are there is no need to go out and get it or demonstrate it or accomplish it or achieve it nor nor can we get it by any thought process but rather since this is an already established truth some way somehow the realization has to dawn on us within our own being now of course in addition to the fact that the master revealed that the kingdom of God is within you it's very clear now that there is no place we can go there is no person to whom we can go there is no outside influence or power upon which we can call that whatever is necessary must lie within the realm of our own being and so there's only one answer now to the search for God whether you find a comfortable chair in your home in the living room or den or library or bedroom or bathroom or whether you go to a public library or a public reading room or whether you find an empty lot somewhere or go to a park bench ultimately you will have to find yourself seated someplace where you can say right here where I am it is right here in the midst of me right here makes no difference if at this moment my bed is in hell still it is here it makes no difference if I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death still it is here where I am whither shall I flee from thy spirit from thy presence lo if I make my bed in hell thou art there but if all those conditions yielded and you had perfect health and perfect wealth and perfect family life and perfect home you still might never find God but right in the midst of whatever hell you are suffering with and it makes no difference sin disease death lack limitation whatever it is in that very position I are called upon to realize God when we do these hells become heaven these discords are revealed as harmony sins even disappear and uh, though we were black yesterday we're white today now if you can follow that you can then see that the next step was a logical one since I have to find this God within my own being and since I'm pretty certain that the infinite nature of heaven or God is such that I'll never find it inside of my body I know now that I must find it in my consciousness within my awareness within range of my awareness or consciousness and so I can now go off to a corner somewhere quiet as peaceful as can be and there engage in a struggle that probably before I get through will tear me from head to foot but which must be gone through because there must be a settling down inside of oneself in order that one can become aware of that which has been called the still small voice 
it isn't necessarily a still small voice. Sometimes it's so loud you're sure that the neighbors down the street can hear it. Sometimes it isn't a voice at all. It's just a gentle, warm feeling of a presence. At other times, it is just a release, as if a weight were dropping off the shoulder. It makes no difference in what way it comes or what form. We will refer to it at this moment as the still small voice. It is as if we were going to listen within our own being for a voice. The little Hebrew lad did that, Samuel. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And uh, that's addressed in here. Not in the body, in the awareness, in the consciousness, in the mind, in the soul of one's being. Speak, Lord, out of the depth of my withinness. Speak. Reveal that. It isn't easy. We started out in infancy with rattles and blocks and trains and dolls and all kinds of external toys. And as we grew older, we took up dancing and jingling money in our pockets and uh, theaters and movies and uh, lately radios and televisions and everything that engages the external awareness so that we are never at peace unless a noise is going on outside of us. With some people, it mounts almost to a fear to be alone or to be still. And so at first we have to train ourselves to be still, to be quiet, to be peaceful, to be serene, not to have the clamor going on outside, to learn to retire away from radios, away from noises, and... Uh, then, beginning with probably one or two minutes of sitting still, gradually learn to increase it until we really can sit without moving for two whole minutes or three whole minutes or four whole minutes in an attentive state of mind, of consciousness. Now, the reason is this. All of the issues of life are within us. If we are seeking health, it is not to be found in the external realm. It is to be found deep, deep down within our consciousness. It will appear externally as the health of the body, but we must first contact it in the withinness. If we are seeking supply, ultimately it will come to us through a position or investments or persons. But if we do not first contact it in the inner stillness within our own being, it won't appear out here as form. In other words, the substance of our health, the substance of our supply, the substance of our companionship, the substance of our skills or abilities, all lie within us, and we must first contact them there. We must first make a contact with some inner presence. Actually, it must come to a point of a response from within, so that you can feel that jump in the air, you can feel that deep breath, or you can feel a warmth go over your body, or you can feel a smile come to your lips. Something takes place within you which enables you to say, Oh, thank you, Father, that was it. When that happens to you, that which you have been seeking will quickly appear in the outer realm, whether it was health or guidance or protection or supply or greater skill, greater ability. 
greater inspiration, whatever it is that we are seeking in the outer realm will in its natural order appear if we contact the source of it which is within our own being. Now just think of this, that we seem to be looking out through these eyes at a great big world and our human teaching is that whatever it is we want we can get out there and bring it to us. And this is a complete reversal. This says that whatever is out there belongs to the other fellow. That we must go for what we want within ourselves. Scripturally, it says, cast thy bread upon the waters. Why should you cast your bread upon the waters so that it can come back to you? How can you do it if you don't already have the bread? Ah, but you do. You have bread, you have wine, you have water, and you have meat. What is your bread, wine, water, and meat? The word I. I am the bread of life. I am the wine and the water and the meat. Where is I? I is in here. I'm voicing it. I am voicing it. And that I is bread and meat and wine and water. And if I want to enjoy any of it, I have to cast it out on the waters so it can come back to me. In other words, somewhere or other you have read this, that whatever we would have, we must give. And whatever it is that we give is what we have. What we receive uh, is not ours. It is that of the one who gave it. And it returns to them. Ours is that which we give. We have scriptural authority for that in the 25th chapter of Matthew. Long, it begins along about the 31st verse, I believe. When I was in prison, he visited me. When I was sick, he comforted me. When I was naked, he clothed me. When I was in hunger, he fed me. Oh, Master, oh, Master, when saw we thee in hunger and fed thee? When saw we thee naked and clothed thee? When saw we thee in prison and visited thee? Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And he says that those who do that find their seats in heaven. Harmony, completeness, wholeness, perfection. That's the only heaven there is. And so it is that which flows out from us is that which we have. Would we be forgiven? You can't be. Forgive us our debts as we, in proportion as we, forgive those who trespass against us. Do you see that? Only what we give in service, in love, in truth, is the same way on the higher plane. No one is ever going to know the truth about you unless you start it by knowing the truth about God and this world. When you begin knowing, oh, let's put it in my own case, when I begin to know that God is your individual being, when I begin to know that God is your soul, when I begin to know that God is the very meat, wine, water, bread under your experience, when I begin to know that God is a law of forgiveness operating within you, that is when all those who come in contact with me say, isn't he a nice fellow? Yes, yes, and that's what did it. Not anything that was done externally, but the mere fact that I am able to perceive the Christ of you enables you or those with whom I come in contact to find and recognize the Christ within me. Many of you have undoubtedly been to metaphysical practitioners, and undoubtedly uh, most of you have been to those who really know their business. 
And you know by that that when you go into the presence of a spiritual practitioner or teacher, the first thing you find there is love and understanding. And why is that? Do they love you? No, they don't know you. You're a stranger to them. But by their spiritual illumination, they have learned that God is the reality of you. And therefore, they're in love with you long before they met you. And you felt that as you came into their presence and you began to respond in kind. In the same way, the whole of the healing process is called knowing the truth. So whenever an individual begins to know the truth about you, about your spiritual nature, that is when you begin to respond with health, healing, harmony, and whatever it is that appears to be lacking in your experience. And so it is that when you begin to know the truth about anyone, about everyone, that you bring out that truth in them. We had a very interesting experience, oh, probably three or four years ago, out in Portland, Oregon, where I was asked to conduct a 20 or 25 minute noon meeting for businessmen and women in the downtown district. And we started on the very first day with some Bible passages. And these Bible passages were uh, references to this very thing, revealing that Christ, the spiritual Son of God, is our true identity, revealing that God is individual being. And uh, we were led to experiment for a week. And the experiment went to something like this, that from the moment that we leave this room, from the moment we step out into the hall, we will begin to recognize God as the individuality, as the law, and the reality of every individual we meet, of every person. We will begin to acknowledge God or the Son of God, to sit behind the eyes of everyone we meet. We will begin to understand that love, which is God, animates every individual, every person. And you know what happened? The very first thing that happened was that although these meetings had been going on for several years, neither the elevator operator nor the superintendent of the building had ever been interested enough even to come in to hear a meeting and within three days, both of them were in there, and uh, both of them have since become very, very good students, never missing lectures or classwork in Portland. Now, before the week was over, we were told of wonderful experiences of people going into department stores or shops, and they are finding a complete reversal of what they had experienced before. Instead of uh, negligent clerks, there were attentive clerks. Instead of ugly clerks, there were very considerate clerks, and so forth and so on. In uh, three of our class periods, we had this happen. <clears throat> One was that of a young girl going out of our night class and going down to the coffee shop for some tea before retiring, and they're finding a man at the opposite end of the uh, counter, intoxicated and boisterous, and uh, in her secret place of the Most High began the realization right here, in spite of appearances, is the Christ, the Son of God. Right here is the spiritual uh, entity which God created in the beginning. And uh, this man walked all the way across the restaurant and sat down by this girl and uh, said, won't you talk to me about God? And he kept her there for 30 minutes talking about God, and then he said, this will never happen again, and he went out. And then we had in uh, Honolulu the same experience, a night class, girl going home on a bus, man very boisterously intoxicated, and uh, 
in the same capacity of secretly and silently realizing the true nature of man. When uh, this man came to his stop, he tapped her on the shoulder. He was sitting in back of her, and he said, Thanks, miss, for praying for me. I'm perfectly all right. Three times that has happened to us in classwork, merely because of an ability on the part of an individual to cast their bread upon the waters. In other words, to give out, thereby bring back. Now, there isn't anyone in this room who has ever done any healing work who doesn't know that that is the secret of healing. A practitioner or a teacher who hasn't arrived at a place of consciousness where they hold no condemnation, no criticism, no judgment, but must always be ready to behold the spiritual nature of man has no right to be in the work and never can be successful. It is an utter impossibility to stay a human being with human judgments, human opinions, and uh, human criticisms and condemnations and be a spiritual healer. The example of that, of course, is the greatest healer, Christ Jesus. Have you ever in any part of his works found judgment, criticism, condemnation? No, no, no. To the adulterous woman, neither do I condemn thee. Who is going to cast the first stone? Who made me a ruler over you? Who made me a judge? Over and over and over again, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Don't enter the same state of consciousness that brought you to this past because it'll come back on you and uh, with something worse. But that won't be because I condemn you or criticize you because I'm going to forgive you 70 times 7, but you won't be able to forgive yourself. The more you bring yourself back to your old state of consciousness, the more the evils of the world will press upon you. Now, when you see this, remember this basic point. The harmony that you bring out into manifestation is the harmony that you first find within yourself. If I cannot find your perfection within me, I cannot find it out there in the external world. If I cannot find uh, lack of judgment, criticism, condemnation for your faults, you cannot be healed of your faults. That is, if you are looking to me for that help. And in the same way, your trespasses will never be forgiven you while you are holding someone else in condemnation to their human faults. It doesn't mean that they haven't got human faults. It doesn't mean they may not continue to have them or they may not get worse. But that's none of your business. Your business, my business, is to forgive 70 times 7, to hold no one in criticism, judgment, or condemnation. Our business is to serve, whether we serve spiritually by knowing the truth, or whether we serve in the human way of extending some uh, human help. It makes no difference. It has to be done on both planes, the spiritual as well as the physical. But whatever we do, it comes up out of us. And then we find it in our own experience. Now, when the Master was faced with a multitude of hungry people, did he go outside somewhere to feed them? No, he multiplied. He multiplied. From where did he multiply? Where would you multiply? You can only multiply with your consciousness. That's all. You can only multiply from within your own being. Therefore, your supply can't come to you externally. Ah, yes. Yes, in the early stages, when you are the Hebrews, sitting at the feet of the master, then the master multiplies and feeds you. But the second day he gets mad at you if you come back, and he says, what did you come back for? I fed you yesterday. You should have learned the principle because 
I wasn't setting up uh, free food kitchens. I wasn't setting up temporary aid stations. I was teaching you a principle when I fed you. I'm going to do it once more, but don't come back again. In other words, he was revealing the kingdom of God is within you. The multiplier is within you. What is the multiplier of loaves and fishes? It is the contact that you make. What do you think is the healer? What do you think it is that enabled the master to say, pick up thy bed and walk? Well, let's follow Peter and John, is it, at the temple gate, beautiful, where the crippled man sits and begs. The answer is, silver and gold have I none, such as I have, give I unto thee. Rise, pick up thy bed and walk. And he leaped up and ran. But the Hebrews marveled. Why marvel, ye men of Israel? As if we, with our own understanding or our own power, had done this thing. The God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, God of Israel, hath done this thing. The same Spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead will quicken also your mortal bodies. All right, now let's go back to that. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath done this thing. Where is this God? Where is the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? It's within you. That's where the, that's where the whole kingdom of God is, within you. Where is the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead? It's within you. It's within me. Therefore, if you would do multiplying of supply, if you would do healing works, you must bring the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, you must bring that into manifestation. And the way to do it is to make contact with it within through meditation. When you meditate, when you turn within and realize the kingdom of God is within me, the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is within me, the same spirit that multiplied loaves and fishes is within me. All right, Father, I'm going to sit here until you reveal it. And then you learn to sit and be patient. And at first, you may only be able to sit one or two or three minutes. And it may come and it may not. It may take days, it may take weeks, it may take months before you actually make that first contact and find actually that that same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sprung to life in you. The same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead has come to aliveness in you. But when you feel it jump, out here somebody will say, I'm better. I got a job. My ability is better than it was. My peace of mind is greater than it was. Something has changed in the outer realm because you touched this center, which is God, within you. Now remember, none of these miracles take place because you can recite these truths. None of these miracles take place even if you could recite this tape, if you could learn it by heart and get up and deliver it tomorrow night, you may still not heal even a tiny headache. But if you meditate, forget the words that I've said here tonight. They're of no interest. Remember the idea. The kingdom of God is within you. I didn't discover it, and I didn't invent it. This is a revelation that's as old as time, and... Uh, one of the greatest of all revelators, Christ Jesus, has demonstrated it so clearly that even I, in my little way, have apprehended that truth and adopted it into my living. And I can tell it into you that if you can be patient enough with yourself until you make that contact, you too will find that the multiplier of loaves and fishes is within you that the healing Christ with which Jesus healed. Remember, Jesus didn't do any healing works. He very frankly said that. I can of my own self do nothing. 
the Father within me that doeth the work. When you can make contact with the Father within you, you'll know why he said, I cannot. You'll know that it was not false modesty. You'll know it wasn't any mock humility. It was an actual truth. Jesus could never have healed a headache any more than you will ever heal one or I will ever heal one. But if you make contact with that spiritual presence within you, it will multiply loaves and fishes, it will uh, reform sinners, it will destroy the penalty for sin, it will wipe out lack and limitation, it will do all of these things. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead will do it now for us only. We must make the actual contact within our own being. That is why meditation is the secret, the whole secret, of the message of the infinite way. Without it, remember this, without meditation, the infinite way would be a philosophy of life and it would just be a nice story about uh, Joe Goldsmith's life. But with meditation, it becomes the story of your life or anyone's life who wishes to turn within. That is why, you see, we have no organization and no membership because we have nothing to offer. If you don't contact the Father within you, the infinite way can't do you any good. If you do contact the Father within you, you don't need it anymore. Just as simple as that. Once you have found the kingdom of God within you, then you have found your conscious union with God, and then you will find that all that the Father hath is yours. And then it won't make any difference if you still belong to the Hebrew church, the Protestant church, the Catholic church, or no church, still, if you make the contact within you, the kingdom of God will be yours. Remember, there was a God before there was a church. Remember, there was a God before there was a temple or a synagogue. Remember, there was a Christ before there was Abraham. Ah, oh, that sounds strange, doesn't it? There was a Christ before there was Abraham. And you know, that there is a Christ under the end of the world, that's long after Jesus. And so you see, Christ is a living reality. It is a presence and a power within you. It is the presence and power of God in every individual on the face of the globe, but dormant. Awake, thou that sleepest, Christ will give thee light. This Christ, or Son of God, is dormant within every human being. Now, with some, it lies so close to the surface that just the lightest touch with spiritual wisdom awakens it, brings it to life, and uh, keeps one living and moving and having their being in God forever. With others, materiality has uh, become, or intellectuality sometimes, has become so pronounced that that spiritual spark cannot get through. And with these, it may take months, it may take years, before we can sufficiently die to our human selfhood so that the spirit may be reborn in us. Die daily, Paul tells us. Die daily, be reborn of the spirit. How many days do we die? That depends on the degree of our grossness, depends on the degree of our materiality. It depends on the degree of our on purely material or mental means. Until the time comes when we can completely relax ourselves, both from things and from thoughts, we cannot find the kingdom of God. Now, there are people who have found that the love of money is the root of all evil, and uh, the love of the material realm separates them from the realization of God. But there are other people who don't have that trouble. Their trouble lies in the mental realm. They're so bu busy holding on to thoughts that they can't let God come through. And thoughts will interfere with God just as much as things will, because thoughts are just as material as things at times, and the thoughts that aren't are effects anyhow. No one can ever hold on to a thought and realize God any more than they can hold on to things 
and realize God. Until we are able to release ourselves from things and from thoughts, we cannot realize God. Thoughts are an obstruction just like things are. But when we have died daily to our love of things and of thoughts so that we can hold ourselves in an attitude or an atmosphere of expectancy, of hearing, of receiving from within, then we are ready for the birth of the Christ. Then we are ready for the experience of the spiritual regeneration. Yes, in the earlier days of our experience, we hung on to aspirin tablets and other material remedies and felt they were indispensable. And then the day came when we uh, learned that thoughts were a little better than things and we began to hold on to thoughts. Now comes the day when we have to let go of thoughts in order to find God, that which created all thought. It isn't an easy step. None of it is. Meditation isn't. But it's a worthwhile step because the moment you have achieved it, you never have to look out here to person, place, or thing for anything. You meditate, you achieve a realization of God's presence, and then whatever it is or whoever it is that is necessary to your unfoldment appears as if by magic. It is as if you had invisible wires out into the world, and you have. The invisible presence and power of God. Sometimes they're called angels. Yes, the very moment that you make your contact with this presence and power within. Only remember this. And please know that I'm speaking now only about the message of the infinite way. Don't go into meditation with a definite knowledge of what you want or who, or when, or where. Because in this work, that would be fatal to demonstration. As a matter of fact, it would be impossible. The reason is this. In the infinite way, there is only one legitimate demonstration. That's all. That's the demonstration of the presence of God. Nothing else. In our work, you cannot demonstrate supply. You cannot demonstrate companionship. You cannot demonstrate employment. You cannot demonstrate a home. You cannot demonstrate an automobile. You cannot demonstrate a parking space. You cannot demonstrate a vacation. In this work, and I say it frankly, honestly, there is no possible way to demonstrate anything. No way. We are not an employment agency. We are not a doctor. We're not competitors for Materia Medica. We don't reduce fevers or remove bumps. In this work, we have but one object, one goal, one aim, one ambition. To know thee, whom to know aright is life eternal. That's all. To know thee, God. Now, when God is our goal, and we have no other goal, then we find that the Master was a very, very wise teacher when he said, all these things uh, will be added unto you. As a matter of fact, it isn't quite true. They're not added unto us. That must have been a uh, mistranslation or misinterpretation. They're not added at all. They're included. When we have God, we have all. If we have all and don't have God, we have nothing. Don't ever forget this. There are many, many people who have loads of wealth and loads of health and loads of family and still commit suicide. There is one thing missing, and that is satisfaction, peace. And you can't get that without first finding God. That is why, too, in this work, please believe me, don't ever think you can demonstrate safety. Don't ever believe you can demonstrate security. Don't ever think you can demonstrate peace of mind, because you can't. The only one demonstration you can make is the realization of God's presence. When you have that, you'll find that you'll settle down into peace of mind and peace of soul and 
piece of body and piece of person, piece of about everything there is on earth. But don't try to achieve those things. Try to achieve one thing only, a conscious realization, healing, if you want to call it that, of God's presence. When you have the feeling of God's presence, it may take a day after that or a week or a month, but very soon you will find that probably not major miracles open up, but minor ones do, and a succession of them until when you look back you'll say it was really a major one because your life has been transformed. Whereas before I was blind, now I see. Please, above all things in this work, take my word for this. If you hope to achieve that degree of harmony and peace that everyone longs for, and to which everyone is entitled, give up the search for it. And be content to find God. When you find God, you find that you have enough of everything in this world to satisfy you, even if by that time it isn't the things that you originally would have tried to demonstrate. By the time you get the things that you want, you'll find you didn't want them to begin with. And it's really true, more true in this work than in anything I know, because I can think myself of many, many, many of the things that I started out in life to achieve and haven't achieved. And I'm awfully grateful that I haven't achieved it too, because what I have achieved has given me, if not what the world calls happiness, at least it has given me a reason for living. And you know, that's something worth having. It isn't too many years ago that I was on my deathbed and uh, knew it. I knew that that was the night of my going. But with it came the realization, just think what a failure my life has been. I haven't even repaid my mother for the birth pain she suffered. I think I better stay here a while and see if I can't do better. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to at last come to a place where you can say, well, at least I have gained what my mother would like me to have gained. I have gained an inner sense of contentment, a peace, a satisfaction, of a conviction that there's a God. And after all, that is a major accomplishment. There aren't many people on earth who believe in God. Lots of people will say they believe in God, but by that they mean they believe there is a God, but they believe it in the same way that we probably believe there are people on some of the other planets. We hope so at any rate, and so we hope there's a God. But we haven't had the experience. So we don't really know. If you abide in meditation, if you seriously take up the work of meditation, eventually you will have an experience, and then after that there will be no question whether there's a God or whether you believe in it, or whether or not the world believes in it. You will know. And uh, nobody will be able to shake your belief by saying, oh, if there was a God there wouldn't be so much sin, disease, and death in the world, because by that time you will know why there is sin, disease, and death in the world, because people haven't achieved the experience of God. And separate and apart from God, anything can happen in this world. Anything. This whole world is a world of chance, luck, or what have you, except in proportion as we attain a contact with God. Then we are God-governed, God-maintained, God-sustained. Then we can say, I am the bread, and I am the wine, and I am the water. It is all within me. Now, Browning's poem tells us truth is within ourselves. We must make way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. And I give it to you as the basis of the infinite way that light, truth, and love, an infinity of supply, harmony, wholeness, completeness, and perfection already exist within you, and you will never be able to get them from the outside but you can release them from within you so that they escape to the without. Then you'll be fed always as the Master was. I can give you water, living water. If you drink it, you will never know death because it flows out. This Word of God, which is life eternal, flows out. If it flows out, it can't flow too. 
Oh, no. The flowing at this minute from me to you is a temporary thing like the mass of healing the sick and feeding the hungry. Those were temporary things, and he said so. If I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. So if I feed you today, it's to show you a principle. If I heal you today, it's to show you a principle. But don't go on leaning on it, because you're drawing on my light. You must light the light within your own being, and I give it to you in this wise, meditation is the way. The kingdom of God is within you. Find it there. You don't have to go to India. You don't have to go to Rome. You don't have to go to Boston, and you don't have to come to Hawaii. The kingdom of God is within you, right where you are. It is a nice thing to go to those teachers who have achieved some measure of spiritual illumination because they, as the Master said, can be the way, the truth, and the life to you and can help you, though they cannot save you from taking the last mile yourself. But they can help you and lift you up to a point of apprehension. For that reason, then, if you find your teacher in any nation on the globe or any city, be happy to go there, even if you have to sell all that you have to go there. But go there remembering that it is that the Christ of you may be revealed to you so that you in turn can go and do likewise. Thank you. Well, once more in New York, let us say good evening, huh? Good evening. Yeah, that's for our friends who will be hearing us through the tape recordings. I recognize the fact that most of you who are here this evening have not had very much of work with me, either in lecture or classwork, and probably to many of you the study of the writings is rather recent. And so I would like to tell you first of all a couple of points that you may look for in the message of the infinite way that you will find to be a foundation or basic point or points in this unfoldment. You see, the message of the infinite way is, above all things, a practical thing. It's a practical experience. I mean by that, that it is religious and it is mystical, but it is practical in that, in this message, the Word must become flesh and dwell among us. That is, that whatever it is that we learn of truth through the message of the infinite way must become practical in our experience. In other words, the Master, Christ Jesus, and uh, all of this work is to be found in the New Testament, was asked, Art thou he that should come? John the Baptist seriously questioned, uh, even though he was the one who introduced the Master, nevertheless he later questioned, uh, Art thou he that should come? Did I make a mistake? Are you really that one? And the Master didn't answer, Certainly I am. You know I am. He answered, Go show John what things ye have seen. The sick are healed. The blind are given their sight. To the poor, the gospel is preached. The dead are raised up. And that, of course, was his answer. Proof. By their fruits ye shall know them. If this message doesn't regenerate you, if it doesn't lift you up out of bodily sins, bodily diseases, 
bodily false desires, false appetite, appetites, if it doesn't lift you above a mortal and material sense of life, above the lacks and limitations and struggles of our day, then so far as you are concerned, the word is not becoming flesh, and the message is not yours, or else you have not received it. This work that we are engaged in, these writings that you are probably reading, the recordings that you will be hearing when I'm not taking the place of a recorder, will all be bringing to you assurances and promises of healings, reformations, increases in good. And you have the right to expect these but you will have no right to expect them unless you are in accord or in tune with the principle that is revealed. And the very first principle is that you must not be seeking supply or companionship or parking spaces or new automobiles or new homes. In uh, the fourth chapter of Matthew, we read, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And there you have your text. Had the Master believed that he had to make a demonstration of bread, he would have uh, obeyed the devil and said, Good. Let us now see if we can make a demonstration of bread out of nothingness or out of stones or out of thoughts. And then he would have uh, missed the chance to be our savior, our revelator. Because there is only one way, and he knew that, there is only one way to be fed, and that is to give up all thought of being fed and seeking the kingdom of God, seeking the realization of God, seeking attunement or at one with God, seeking the realization of God as bread. You see, when you have God, you have bread. How do we know that? I am the bread. I am the meat. I am the wine. I am the water. And so you see, you can't have bread, meat, wine, water, unless you have me, I, I am. Unless you have the achieved realization of God, you do not have the bread, because there is no bread separate and apart from God. Having God, you have bread. Having no God, you have no bread, even if your stomach is full. Oh, there are many, many millions of people who have abundantly to eat of the earth's food and to drink and with what to wear, but they have nothing, they're starving. They're starving in the midst of the abundance with which they are filling their bodies and their purses. Why? because you're not fed by bread alone. It's true, you do need some bread, but that doesn't feed you, that doesn't satisfy. It is the water of life eternal that satisfies. It is the bread of life that satisfies. It is the word of God, which is spirit, that satisfies. And so, even if you crammed your stomachs with food and your backs with diamonds, you still would be unhungered if you had all of the companionship there is to be found in the world, you would be lonesome. 
unless that companionship were in and of God. In other words, we in this room could be strangers to each other, even enemies of each other, unless there were the presence of love. The presence of love would be the bond between us that would constitute companionship, not just our physical presence in this room. Oh no, here we are, a group of people in the room, and yet each one of us could be all alone and lonesome in this room except for the fact that there is a bond, and that bond is a love of truth. And because of that, we could not be lonesome here in this room. But go out to the ballpark, go out to the movies, and see how very lonesome you can be in those mobs. Why? Because you have nothing in common with them. The one missing link is God, truth, love, life, spirit. You see that? So it is. You will come, first of all, in the message of the infinite way, to the fact that we are not to have our thought on the demonstration of things. We are not to have our thought on the demonstration of persons or amounts or conditions. True, if they are not added unto us once we have achieved the realization of God, the message isn't true. But you'll find that once you have achieved the realization of the presence of God, that no good thing will be withheld from you. It won't be given to you either. You'll find that it's included in that Godhood, Christhood, realization of spiritual identity. And... Uh, the secret of all of this is to be found in the word I. All of this is to be found in the word I. This point you will not so readily understand until you have some kind of a spiritual experience that confirms it. But the truth is is that God, this universal storehouse of good, is the I am of your being. There is no God outside or separate or apart from the I, which is the I of your individual being. That I is God. God is that I. God constitutes that I of your being. And now watch this. It is for this reason that no good can ever come to you. No good can ever come to you. Every bit of good that will ever take place in your experience is embodied at this moment within you awaiting an opportunity to come forth into manifestation or expression. I could illustrate that in this way and say to you that no man or woman in the history of the world has ever invented anything. There has never been an inventor at any time in history. There are men and women who have discovered laws that always existed and then wrote them down or hooked them up. Where were these laws? For instance, in the days of Moses, where were the laws of electricity? Well, you know, they existed just as much then as they do now. Only... No one had brought them through into visible harnessing. But they were there. Whatever laws are used in hooking up this electricity existed throughout all time. The same with radio, the same with television, the same with wireless. All of these great things have existed throughout all time. And somewhere, sometime, an individual reached way back in his consciousness 
Perhaps you have seen photographs of Thomas A. Edison always doing this, always holding his hand up to his ear as if he were listening to what? To what? The something within him that was going to tell him this next law, this next rule, this next something that had to be known in order to bring his inventions to perfection. You see, the laws always existed. An individual just reaches back. There are 88 keys on a piano, millions and millions of notes, combinations of tones and melodies, and they all exist right now. And there are those individuals who are musically in, in tune and they reach back into their consciousness and they bring forth out of consciousness a combination of melodies that have always been there. Every word that's ever been written has existed throughout all time in consciousness and some author just reached back into consciousness and drew it forth. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. Everything exists in consciousness. Now, in what consciousness do the laws of electricity, radio, television, atoms, nuclear fission, where, where do these exist? They exist in that consciousness we call God. But that consciousness is your consciousness and mine. I and the Father are one. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I and my Father are one. Remember that, that the divine consciousness is your individual consciousness. Ah, you say, but we're not showing very much of that forth, are we? Our demonstration isn't very good. That's true. That doesn't mean that the fact isn't true, that or that this principle isn't true, that God is individual consciousness. It just means that our not having recognized that, we have been satisfied to bring through that which is the result of our environment, education, and personal experience. And so we're satisfied that, well, what can you expect? I only had this much education, or what can you expect? I only had this much opportunity. What can you expect? I only had this much of a family background. And so we limit ourselves to environment, education, and personal experience when all of the time we could transcend those by reaching back into our consciousness where God is forever pouring through the infinities of its own being. We need only reach back into that same place where the artists and uh, musicians and writers have always reached back to bring forth their gems. Where? Back into consciousness. What consciousness? God consciousness, which is your and my individual consciousness. There's only one God. So if all of us have God, we must all have the same God. And it is true. We all have the same God since there is only one. We have the same consciousness, the mind, same mind, the same spirit, the same soul, because there is only one. Now, in the, the message of the infinite way, God is understood, recognized, to be this infinite being, this all-inclusive, eternal completeness perfection. But God is understood to be the individual completeness of you and of me, awaiting our recognition and drawing it forth. Now, the moment that you sit down to pray to God for anything, you virtually make it impossible to receive it, because you're starting with the fact that it is separate and apart from you, and there is a God who could give it to you, but for some unknown reason, God is withholding it from you, and so you start off by dishonoring God. Also, you start off by setting your good, 
separate and apart from your own being. It is just as if you were going out to search for the stars and you started digging in the ground in your backyard. You won't reach the stars that way. They aren't there. You have to look up to find the stars. And so it is, if you look any other place than within your own being for your good, you will not find it. You will set up a sense of separation. In the first place, it isn't nice to think about it, but most prayers are insults to God. For instance, recently before the uh, Geneva meeting, a minister held a public service to pray, and his prayer was to tell God what Mr. Eisenhower needed at uh, Geneva, what Mr. Bulgana needed, what Mr. Eden needed, what Mr. Foray needed, and then prayed that God give it to them. That doesn't leave much room for God to use any judgment in his government of the world. If this man knew better than God did what Mr. Eden needed or Mr. Eisenhower, or if God were waiting for this man's prayer before he would give it to these gentlemen, said kind of a God, isn't it? And then, it is so when we pray for health or an automobile or wealth or a new business or a new position. It is as much as to say, God, you didn't know I needed this until I come along here and tell it to you. And of course, you wouldn't give it to me anyhow until I begged and pleaded for it or sacrificed my son or something. That isn't honoring God. God must be known as omniscience. That is all wisdom, all knowledge. God must also be known as divine love. Once you know God as omniscience, you wouldn't dare tell God anything. Certainly you would not attempt to influence God. And if you understood God as divine love, you would never for a minute doubt that God knoweth your need before you do, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Ah, but this leads to a natural question. If this is true, why uh, aren't these men imbued with the knowledge and wisdom that they should have? Why aren't all of our needs met and the world's needs if God is divine love and knoweth our needs before we do? And if it is God's good pleasure that we bear fruit richly, why is the world suffering so much from lack and limitation? That's a natural question and a legitimate one. And the answer is also to be found in Scripture. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, then all of these good things are being made manifest in your experience, and none of the evil ones can come nigh your dwelling place. And if any of the evils are coming near nigh your dwelling place, you are not yet dwelling, living, moving, having your being in the secret place of the Most High. It also tells us in the 15th chapter of John that if you abide in this word and if you let this word abide in you, you will bring forth fruit richly. It is your Father's will that you bear fruit richly. But, ah, that but, if you do not abide in me, and if you do not let my word abide in you, then you are as a branch that is cut off and withereth. There you have humanity. Humanity is a branch. It's really a branch of a spiritual tree. It's of the household of God. But it's a branch that is cut off. And that's why it is withering. That is why mankind is suffering sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation because it is living out here on uh, the baubles of life. It is living out here on effects. It is living out here on things. And it has become separated from its source. 
Now, an indi- let me show you something. No good can ever come to you except as an activity of your country. In other words, you enter into this picture in relationship to God. The Master says, do you believe that I can do this thing? Do you have faith as a grain of mustard seed? You see, there has to be an activity of truth in your consciousness that constitutes the contact with God. So if you were to just sit out here and wait for something to happen, you might dry up waiting. If uh, you sit around telling God what things you have need of and asking for them, you may starve to death waiting for them. But if up here in your consciousness you accept an activity of truth, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you will begin to know the truth, the truth of your oneness with God, the truth of God as your very life, as your very being, God as uh, closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, God as the sum and substance of your desires and hopes and ambitions, as you begin to know the truth, God is, uh, therefore I am. If you could know the truth as David knew it, David in the 23rd Psalm, there's a little... uh, head note, I suppose, above that 23rd Psalm, says David's assurance of God's grace. David's confidence in God's grace. That whole 23rd Psalm is nothing but the representation of David's confidence in God's grace. And does David pray to God for anything? No, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Oh, think of that confidence. No turning to God. He didn't turn to God for a thing. He just knew the truth. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't have to outline that my rent is due the first of the month or that I need food next week or a new position. I just have to rest here beside the still waters in the realization that God is closer to me than breathing, God is love. God knoweth my needs before I do, and it is his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. That is knowing the truth. That is abiding in the word. That is letting the word of God abide in you. And you haven't asked God for a thing. You haven't tried to influence God to give you more than he has already given you. As you come to that phase of life where you learn to drop your concern for this outer world in the realization that as you attain this inner peace, it will be reflected in outer good, then is when your life in this message of the infinite way has begun. But incidentally, that is the way in which your life in Christ has begun, because The infinite way is really not a teaching of its own or by itself. The infinite way is just another name given to the activity of living in Christ. Living in the realization of Christ as one's true identity, one's true being. If you study carefully the message and the mission of Jesus Christ, you will find that in no place does he ever pray to God for anything for himself. At no time, no place. Not that he didn't need it, because we just read here where he was in hunger. But even being in hunger, he would not pray to God. Why? My Heavenly Father knoweth my need, and it is his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And so if I abide in that truth, there is an activity going on in consciousness which ultimately appears outwardly as my very wine, water, bread, meat. You see, those who seek demonstrations of water, wine, meat, bread, good, in any form, actually believe that there is such a thing when there isn't. 
God is the only bread, wine, water, and meat. God is the only transportation. God is the only home. God is my abiding place. God is my rock. God is my fortress. Do you see how useless it would be to go out and try to demonstrate a, a bomb-proof shelter? When God is itself the bomb-proof shelter and the only one that is absolutely perfect. The only one that will withstand any bomb. When we are hit with Christ and God, when we recognize God to be the bomb shelter, not to give one, not to send one, to be one, ah, then we are in the spiritual way of living. When we stop praying to God for bread and say, God is my bread and God is closer to me than breathing, then I have my bread closer to me than breathing. Now I don't need any. I have it. Even though at this particular moment it may be in the invisible, my recognition of it will very quickly bring it forth into expression and manifestation. That which I recognize as having, that is that which I can demonstrate. Anything that I decree to be separate and apart from me and long for, desire, or pray for, I set up a barrier and it can never break through that barrier. All that I can ever have is that which I can claim now to be a constituted part of my being. Do you see that? If I want tonight to speak to you for an hour, I first must know that the message is within me. That since God constitutes me, the message must be a part of that constituted being. And then when I sit down here, I open my Bible and I open to the fourth chapter of Matthew, which I hadn't thought about for a second before I came here, and I find our message. Where was it? It was in God. Where was it? It was in me. Why? Because I and the Father are one. And if we're going to write a book, or if we're going to paint a picture, or if we're going to compose a piece of music, where are we going to find it? Within me. If we don't find it within me, we won't bring it out on the canvas or on the sheet of music paper or on the pages of the, that which is to be our manuscript or our book. The kingdom of God is within you. As you begin your career in uh, the infinite way, you begin with that realization. The secret is embodied in the word I. I and my Father are one, and that I is my bread, wine, meat, water. Therefore, I do not live by demonstration. I do not live by demonstrating things. I live by demonstrating the realization of God as my being. I live uh, by virtue of the fact that Christ, the Son of God, is my true identity. Invisible? Surely. Surely if you look at me through your eyes, you're just going to see five by five. But if you have an inner eye and look up in this direction, you will say, that isn't coming out of a man. That's coming out of a spirit. And then you'll know the secret. There is a spirit in man. And by my giving recognition to that, then I can open my mouth and let the word of God come through. But if I were an artist, I would do the same. If I were a painter, if I were a sculptor, if I were an author, if I were a composer, I would do the same. I would realize that the infinity of God is embraced in God, but I and that God are one. Therefore, all that God has, I have. All that God is, I am. And then, after a moment of silence, of peace, I would let it flow through, and it would flow. It would flow, as you have seen it flow from all those whom you've ever known of a creative nature. All those who have creative spirits are not creators. Oh, no, no. They are merely people who let the creative spirit of God 
use them. And there we come to another great difference in the message of the infinite way. We never use God and we never use truth. Under no circumstances and under no conditions permit yourself to believe that you are so almighty that you can use God. That's a sin, even to think that you can swing God around by your will. But you can let God use you. You can be an instrument through which God can flow. You can open your consciousness as the boy Samuel did and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant hear it. Don't be a master of God, telling God what to do. Be a servant of God or an instrument of God. Let it, if you say it takes humility. That's true. That's true. It does. Any man who thinks that he of himself is something has lost his vision. He's going on the rocks fast. I, of my own self, can do nothing, was voiced by one of the greatest spiritual seers of all ages. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me was voiced by that same individual. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I, was voiced by that same individual. And the moment you realize that, I and the father are one, right here and now, all the father hath is mine, but God is that father, that infinity, and I am that small end of the funnel through which it flows. Oh yes, the small end of the funnel and the big end of the funnel, it's all the funnel. So they can say one. But the infinity comes from the big end, and so it is the big end of each one of us is God. But that God is closer to us than breathing. It is within us. It is the very mind and soul and spirit and consciousness of us so that even if we were in a rubber boat in the middle of the Pacific or the middle of the Atlantic and checkbooks were no good and there were no corner delicatessens there we could still say Father here's your son and Rickenback approved that three times a day the food came and water came fish jumped up out of the water into the boat birds came down and sat on his head just begging to be eaten. Rain came out of cloudless skies for three weeks. Not just one meal, not just one miracle. Three weeks of daily miracles fed those men because one with God was a majority, because one of those men knew this truth. One of those men sat this way and didn't pray to God. He just sat there and let God flow. Let God use him as an instrument through which to feed those other men. And so it is that every individual who has ever been responsible for healing work knows that there is no such thing as being a healer. There is no such thing as healing. There is only such a thing as being an instrument through which the invisible nature of us can flow to the visible. It wasn't Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. No, he just stood at the tomb and looked up. It wasn't Jesus who multiplied loaves and fishes. No, he just looked up. And the Father within me, he did the works. So with us today. No individual in and of himself is anything but an instrument through which the glories of God are made evident on earth. But if you can be silent enough, and if you can stop talking to God, telling God, praying to God, trying to sway God or influence God. If you can stop all that long enough to be still and let the still small voice use you, then you will find that there is a God and that God is right here in our human scene. Oh, not to the world. No, no, no. A thousand will fall at the left and ten thousand will fall at the right. Why? They're the ones who are telling God. But that one individual who lives in the realization that God is a spirit, God is a spirit within man, and that this spirit reveals itself in its own way, talks to us in its own language, reveals to us its own demonstrations, as we learn that state of humility, then, then we find God really is.
God doesn't need us to ask him uh, what wisdom we need or tell him what wisdom we need. No, God is ever-present where we are. And that God within us is the sum total of our good, so that you must, first of all, believe me when I say, do not try to get good. Do not try to achieve or accomplish from the outside. Rather, make some activity within your own consciousness, some form of truth, so that you change it around to say, no, whatever of good there is must flow out from me, not come to me. It may be that you want to be forgiven for something or other. Don't expect it. It may never happen. Unless you are the one to do the first forgiving. If you will begin a forgiving process today, you will find that it will be very few weeks or months before all your sins will have been forgiven you. But praying to be forgiven won't bring forgiveness to you. It is you who must do forgiving. It is in the same way it may be that you require some service of someone. Don't expect it. You're more likely to be disappointed. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, you will learn there that it is you who have to serve the least of these, my brethren, and in doing that, that you are doing it unto the Christ. Then when you begin to give one hour of service to someone or one dollar of cash to someone or one ounce of forgiveness to someone or one ounce of assistance to someone, then you will find that you are casting your bread upon the waters and that bread will come back to you. In other words, don't look for any good to come to you. Always remember that good is stored up within you and you must find a way for that good to flow out from you then you'll see how the reflex action is in that good coming back to you. Now, it is a strange thing. When first we begin to realize that we have actually been expecting a good to come to us from a god or a parent or a friend or a neighbor or a relative and wondering why it hasn't happened all these years just as if we, we have been expecting peace to come on earth. How can peace come on earth? If it isn't uh, in you first, how can you expect it in someone else? Everyone else is as barren as we are. If we want peace, it must first be found in our hearts. Then we find it in the hearts of those with whom we come in contact. But to sit here and say, I'm waiting for peace to come out there, you'll wait and wait and wait and wait, as the world has been waiting for several thousand years. It won't come. Never will. Peace is found the same place that safety, security, protection, and abundance are found within you. You won't find it anyplace else. You will be safe from wars, depressions, bombs, when you find safety in the kingdom of God within you. You will find yourself at peace with this world when you find a state of peace within you toward this world. There's no other way. The kingdom of God is within you. Don't expect to add to it from outside, but share it from within. There is no depletion in sharing what we have. The reason is, it isn't ours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so regardless of what we give to each other, we are not giving from ourselves, but from that infinity which is God. Ah, it's true. If you once realize that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, you will very quickly catch the next statement. Son, all that I have is thine. And then you'll know that all that God has, you have. But unless you first claim it for God, you cannot have it for yourself. There is no way for you to possess anything. Those who think they do, well, they, they must uh, accompany me on some of my airplane trips and smile with me as I look down on the earth 
and see fences around people's property and think that down there somebody thinks they own all that's inside that fence and two blocks down the road is a cemetery. <laughs> and then you see the, the, the humor in that belief that we possess something. We don't. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the minute you begin to perceive it in that light, you lose all sense of personal possession, but then in the next breath, you watch the whole infinity of God flowing through you. Probably there won't be as much of it stick to your fingers from then on, because there would have to. You see the uselessness of laying up where moth and rust doth corrupt. Ah, but you see, there's the wisdom. I am the bread, the wine, and the water. I am life eternal. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then he turns around and says, Son, all that I have is thine. That's the mystery. That's the miracle of supply. That's the mystery and the miracle of safety. That's the mystery and the miracle of security. That's the mystery and the miracle of peace on earth. What I find within myself and share with you, that's what I have more of. What I claim for myself and try to hoard, the moths get at it. And if they don't, the rust does. And if they don't, well, at the end of every human road, they've set up a probate court. Everybody has to pass through it and check in all their valuables as they go out. Nobody takes it with them. And so we might just as well learn that our mission in life is really to understand we do not possess. We are possessed. God possesses us. God is our life. God is our soul. God owns our bodies. God sends it on its mission. And it's always successful when God sends it. It's when we decide on a mission for ourselves and decide when it'll take place and where and how much we'll get for it. That's when the failure comes in. It's only when we understand ourselves to be instruments of the Most High, but the Most High closer to us than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Then, too, in this way, we have to overcome a little of our old theology. You'd be surprised how much old theology there is in every single one of us. I know there are people right in this very room who are suffering because of the belief of some past sins, or believing that their good is being withheld from them because of some act of omission or commission for which they're sorry, but they can't get the free of or forgiven from. Now you see, all of that is a carryover from old theology. Though your sins be scarlet, this very minute you are white as snow. Why? Because you have no past. You have no past and you have no future. The only second you can ever know is this second. And your degree of sinlessness is whatever your consciousness is at this very moment and because there is no sin in your consciousness at this moment there is no penalty for what doesn't exist now every moment is just a continuation of this moment and so unless you go back to yesterday's state of consciousness as the master put it go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you unless you go back to old states of fear and doubt and suspicion and hesitancy, unless you do that, you are safe at this moment from any persecution or prosecution for past offenses. You are free in Christ, in the realization of Christ as uh, your true being and your true identity. Never believe for a moment that once we have turned our gaze in a spiritual way, that we have to go back and work out yesterday's karma isn't true. Karma lasts within us only up to the point of regeneration. You will find this as one of the major teachings of Christ Jesus. When he met the adulterous woman, or the woman taken in adultery, neither do I condemn thee. When he was faced with the man on the crucifix, the thief on the crucifix, I will take you into heaven with me this very night. Who hath condemned you? 
who judges you? Who made me a ruler over you? The Master's teaching is full of the fact that at this moment your sins are forgiven you. Just don't go back to the old beliefs that you must get something from God or from man. And stand fast in the truth that all that the Father hath is yours within your being now. And as you maintain yourself in that consciousness, you will find that the past will not enter your present. That all lies within us to disown our yesterdays. None of us can uh, undo the work of yesterday because our sins of yesterday were the result of our ignorances. And uh, that can't be avoided. But once we are out of ignorance and into the light, how can there be any more penalty for ignorance? And so it is, each one of us faces an opportunity every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month every minute can be a complete fresh one and if we were to go out of this room tonight pure as snow and tomorrow we should be tempted into robbing a bank or committing adultery there is still all the rest of the minutes in the day to start fresh again and say again ignorance overtook me but I am in the way Unto seventy times seven you must learn to forgive yourself just as you must learn to forgive me. You will never learn to forgive your enemies. You'll never even learn to forgive your relatives seventy times seven if you cannot learn to forgive yourself for your offenses. And if you commit offenses tonight and tomorrow, forgive them again and again and again. Unto seventy times seven, or you will never get up to 490 before you'll be completely purged of any recurrence. But instead of groveling in our errors, instead of condemning and finding fault and damning ourselves and holding ourselves in hell because of our fault, let us rather learn to forgive ourselves. Seventy times seven. And start over and start over and start over. And one of these times it will click and no more temptation will ever come up. You know, we're no better than the master. And you know, the master was always being tempted. It says in Scripture, the devil left him for a season. That's all, just for a season. The devil came back again. Always with some fresh temptation. Three times up there on the mountain. Another time when he saw an adulterous woman, and I suppose he was tempted right there and then to believe what he saw. And then he saw people and hungered up on a hill. And then he saw Lazarus dead. All of these were temptations to him. And he had to forgive himself over. Father, forgive me for seeing these things because I have no right to see them. They don't exist in God. So it is with us. In our humanhood, let nobody claim perfection. It doesn't lie in humanhood to be perfect. The Master said that too. Why callest thou me good? There is but one good, the Father in heaven. And so let us not claim any goodness for ourselves as human beings, but let us claim that our divine heritage is the goodness of God. And then if we fall down, let's pick ourselves up and start over again, just the same as I have witnessed in this work throughout the years. People suffering and going to metaphysical healers for help and sometimes not getting the help and being compelled to return to Materia Medica for some temporary help and often they condemned themselves for it and thought of themselves as failures and, and didn't want to start back on the metaphysical path again. And I would say, foolish child, foolish child. We've all done the same thing. We've all fallen down a thousand times. When I started in this work, I had one healing metaphysically and three medically. It just didn't work, that was all. That's no harm. It just represents our state of ignorance at that time. And so it is. There isn't anybody in this world that isn't tempted with lack or limitation or insecurity or fear. That's nothing to be ashamed of. Just acknowledge it. Acknowledge it as a part of that mesmeric influence of this world, the Satan that tempts us every season or so. And then start fresh again, and you'll find that one of these sweet days we pass from the intellectual perception of this truth 
into an actual inner spiritual realization of it and then after that it becomes very foolish even to talk about it you'd be surprised how I can talk for hours and hours and hours and hours to young students and then get me alone with some of our students who have been with me for years and I'm dumb I can't talk anymore I can meditate and I can say one sentence and that's all that's to it because it's foolishness. All that I'm saying here tonight is foolishness after you've had the experience. Because it's unnecessary to say it. It's experience. It is so. It is a realized truth. But it all begins with the word I. I remember is God. I am is God. That very I of you, invisible, is God. And it contains the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and it is just eager waiting to press it out through you don't make the mistake of trying to demonstrate it or get it or achieve it from outside don't make the mistake of trying to get bread wine or water in any form don't do it get god and you'll find god is bread wine and water don't try to get safety or security don't do it get god and you'll find god is the rock and god is the fortress and god is the high tower you see that don't try to get those things. Try to get God and find that God is those things. That's really the inside secret of the message of the infinite way. Thank you for this opportunity to share it.